This is off planet radio. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Emily Moyer. Randy Moggins is still on vacation, but fear not. I have a fantastic co-host tonight. And when Randy decided to go on his uh, uh, little, we decided Randy was going to take a little vacation. I, I had some trouble deciding who some of the co-hosts would be. I had to think about it a little bit. There was one that was just an obvious no-brainer. And so my buddy, my brother, Robert Phoenix, is here to co-host with me tonight. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Pleased to be here, Emily. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You've got a big seat to fill, dude. Actually, it's like this tiny. Randy's really skinny right now. <laughs> I know, mean, but, but Randy throws off some intellectual wattage, man. Yeah, for I got, sure. I, I, I got to I gotta take my game to another level tonight. Absolutely. You got to take it off planet. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so Robert and I have been going like in circle. Well, first of all, before we get into everything, how are you? What's going on in, in Robert Phoenix world? I know you're making some changes over on your website and your show. Why don't you fill everybody in before we get started? Yeah, so I, I put uh, 15 minutes of flame and just suspended hibernation until uh, the, right around the, the uh, 23rd or 24th of August. Um, only because I need to reformat a bunch of stuff on my website, my, my various worlds. Yep. So, um, yeah, that's kind of, that's, I guess that's happening, not happening. But I'm still doing Sunday night live streams on YouTube for astrology. And we just had a kind of an amazing one uh, mm -hmm. this last Sunday night on the heels of the uh, passing of one uh, Anthony Bourdain, which I hope we can get around to talk about tonight. For sure, yeah. You and I had a really cool conversation around that the other day. So, yeah, we can get into some of that for sure. Yeah. And um, – You're still doing Friday Forecast? Yeah, I'm still, I still do the – I'm going to do it this, uh, this Friday from Philadelphia at Solutions, which is a bookstore um, slash kind of center, uh, community center sort of place in uh, New, Newtown, Newton, uh, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia. So I'll be doing it live then and I'll, I'll be back on the air um every friday starting this friday with the friday does friday. randy know you're going to be there i'll have to tell randy you're going to be it because he's only he does know i'm going to be there he's on the other side of the state he's an hour from philadelphia you said philadelphia right he's not only yeah, like Randy's closer to, to um like uh pittsburgh he's closer to pittsburgh hey he told me he's only an hour from philadelphia oh that's right he's he's kind of near allentown isn't he He's in Harrisburg, but like I know he went to like the Free Your Mind conference because it's that was in Philadelphia. I, I don't. Let's make sure, let's remind him and make sure he knows you're going to be. Yeah, there. you know. Now that you mention it, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to reach out to Randy, pull pull him out of his top secret vision quest <laughs> experience and go bug him for a little bit. That would be. I, well, but I, I I have not yet had the well other than doing it on the phone and on the show and stuff. I haven't had the personal pleasure of irritating the shit out of Randy in, in person yet. I'm yeah. looking forward to that. But other people, others have. I've I've hired others to do it on my behalf. So, right. <laughs> well, I'll be your stand-in. How's that sound? All right, that sounds good. And what's just um, before we kind of hop into tonight's chosen uh, topics. Um, where are we astrologically just a little bit, just kind of, we're getting into the summer here. We're, we're in Gemini, uh, by the time, probably when, by the time the show goes, go, you know, is out, we'll be close to into cancer. Hope, hope, yeah. So where, where, yeah, where so are we? We've got a couple of eclipses coming up in, uh, July. The one that I really is grabbing me is the one, uh, on the 13th of July. That's a lunar eclipse. Mm-hmm. And that's a Friday. So we have a Friday the 13th lunar eclipse, which is what I talked about on my show on uh, Sunday night. And um, that could be a very kind of intense eclipse because it's going to be in cancer. It's not, it's not going to cross over um, the United States. Um, I think parts of Europe and Africa and um, kind of Eurasia will see this eclipse. And it's not even a full eclipse. It's a partial eclipse. So it's not like we're getting a, a big whammy. But it's going to be in um, in Capricorn, and I'm sorry, in Cancer, 
which means we're going to get some opposition energy with Pluto and Capricorn and Saturn and Capricorn as the moon goes through the eclipse phase. And, you know, we're really in this very interesting time of these kind of the battle. It's not really a battle, but it's kind of like this balancing out of these Capricornian and Cancerian energies. And Capricorn is all about, you know, it's top down, it's, it's hierarchical, it's bureaucratic. Um, it's kind of like, a, you know, how about, what was it, about a week ago now that the EU passed all these new sorts of privacy and um, terms and conditions on, on almost every single website on the planet. Like, how many emails did you get about, please, you know, agree to, you know, our new terms and conditions, our privacy policy. I mean, so that's very Capricornian in a lot of ways. It's taking place in an Aquarian format, but it's extremely top down. And it's the EU which is determining how we're going to share information, which I thought, you know, this could be, this could be a disaster in a lot of ways. Because one of the things that the EU has talked about is um, copyright law. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're like, I mean, they're very big sticklers for things like copyright law and rights to, um, you know, cer certain materials on the web. So, for instance, let's say you found a picture of um, Angela Merkel and you wanted to make a meme out of that picture. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very strong possibility with what's happened and some of these uh, privacy policies and copyright commands that are coming out of the EU. And by the way, it just, it just went across the board. It was like there was no kind of questioning about it. It was like, here it is. And it wasn't even the United States. It was like coming from the EU. So if you decided you wanted to use a picture of her and create a meme, um, if they wanted to, they could say, well, this person owns the copyright to this, this picture. And it could be AP, it could be Reuters. It could be a photographer. Right. And so their, their pitch is that they want to make sure that the people that actually have the work and own the work get compensated by, for the work. And while that sounds quite good in a lot of ways, um, somebody owns just about everything. Yep. So unless you're going to create your own meme, um, it could become very, very difficult moving forward for some of these really pernicious kinds of copyright laws that are being slipped in in these privacy policies, the terms and conditions, all this stuff. This is very Capricornian, okay? Yeah. This is why I'm talking about it. So on the other hand, you know, the sort of the, the backside of, of Capricorn is, is cancer. And we'll get into this when we get into Anthony Bourdain a little bit because he was a cancer for degrees cancer. And cancer is much more kind of local, organic. He, he, was a, he was a cancer? Anthony Bourdain's a cancer? I'm a cancer too, so that's interesting. Anthony okay. Bourdain was born on June 25th. I'm June 29th. Okay, that's interesting. Which puts him four days away from the summer solstice. So my birthday, is the, the summer solstice is the 21st. Okay, got yeah, yeah. yeah. So four days away from the summer solstice, which today I got into this whole idea that Anthony Bourdain was the wicker man, which I... I I do believe he was the wicker man and the wicker man is as most people know, or if they don't know is a man that is made out of basically sticks and hay. And um, it's, it's kind of a wood composite of a man. Mm -hmm. and the wicker man was first discovered by Julius Caesar when his troops moved northward and they moved into like juridic territory. And they saw this ritual where, you know, they would have this, facsimile of a man and inside the man there were a bunch of different things like there was flowers and plants sometimes they put animals sometimes there would be humans inside the man and so the burning of the man if there was indeed a life form and if that life form was indeed a human was a ritual sacrifice for the village did i wonder if anthony bourdain's ever been to burning man well that's really interesting i, I don't know about that but <sighs> This is a great point you bring, you bring up because last year um, there was a guy who actually broke the, the security line. Yeah, no, we talked about it on the show. We talked, we talked about it with you even maybe, yeah. Yeah, and he, and he jumped into the man. Yep. And he, he burned to death. Well, what's interesting about that is that Larry Harvey, 
who is the founder of Burning Man, died this last year. Yeah. So you had really this kind of archetypal reenactment of the Burning Man. Well, and then also now the theme for this year is I, Robot. So they've burned the man and now they're a robot. Interesting. Well, Larry Harvey is gone. So the creator of Burning Man died months after somebody ran inside of the, uh, yeah. the man and was self-immolated. It's interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. I used to hang out at these parties in San Francisco called the Anon Salon. Mm -hmm. He was there all the time. I used to run into him all the time. And he, he, he actually wore a cowboy hat a lot of the time. He was kind of this, kind of this retro hipster. And the story uh, around him was he was, breaking, he was breaking up with a woman, which is very close and very similar to Bourdain, by the way, mm -hmm. because Asia Argento was, was dumping him, right? That was happening. Anyway, um, so he was breaking up with a woman and in order to kind of encapsulate and then uh, <clears throat> immolate his sadness. He created a, a man like the burning man, like the wicker man. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he burned it on a beach in San Francisco. It was like Baker beach or something like that. This was how, this was how burning man got started, right? That's right. And yeah. it was right around 1988. Yeah. And they did it on the beach for a couple of years after that. And then they, the, uh, you know, the parks department said, you can't do this here anymore because more and more people were showing up. Yeah. And so then they relocated it to uh, Black Rock Desert, which is where they have it every year now. So yeah. we could talk, you know, we, we'll go down that rabbit hole if you want with, about, with, uh, with Bourdain. Um, but yeah, so we're in this place now. It's kind of like the Capricornian energies are very, very high. Um, you know, Trump just went to North Korea and whatever that's about, right? I mean... I mean, I think North Korea has just been this kind of like puppet state for a long time. Yeah. I and mean, they sort of set it up and knocked the pins down. Have you ever seen uh, the satellite pictures of light emanating at night from South Korea, North Korea? Have you seen those pictures? No. Okay. So when you look at the pictures, South Korea is completely lit up. And North Korea has this little tiny, tiny point of light. And that's Pyongyang. And everything else is pretty much in darkness. Like the, the country is incredibly backwards yeah, and has very, very little going on, no industry whatsoever. Um, you know, when they decoupled from the Soviet Union back in 19, it was 1990, 1991, they didn't have any money. They weren't getting, they can't produce anything. Right. So they became a client state at that point. So whoever wanted to use North Korea and whatever kind of, either intellectual or geophysical assets, geopolitical assets that they had, they would basically hire North Korea out. So what's happened over the last roughly 30 years is that North Korea became kind of an asset state of the United States and the CIA. So a lot of the stuff that we saw with the missiles, which I believe were actually built and created by Elon Musk mm. uh, and SpaceX, that's, I think a lot of that stuff was just completely fake. Mm -hmm. And they created a very kind of tense and dramatic situation so that it could be resolved very easily now. And this, so we have this, and Trump is, you know, he's played this role. And it's a very Capricornian kind of role. It's like, you know, statesmanship or government, bureaucracy, hierarchy. So it's super Capricornian. But the Cancerian piece is the underbelly to all of this. And the Cancerian piece is sensitivity in home and emotion. And I, you know, I was talking with Regina um, with the interview that we did last week. And I, and I brought up a statistic with her, which was the most watched network on cable TV is um, the uh, Hallmark channel. That's the most watched network. Yeah, it's true. Statistically, the Hallmark channel gets more eyeballs than any channel on the internet. And the reason for that is because it has emotional content. Right. You know, a lot of times we get seduced by the fact that Twitter and Fox and CNN and BuzzFeed and um, Breitbart, that these are the bastions of the Vox Populi and that they speak for everybody, whether it's on the left and the right. And in reality, that's not really the case. And if you look at the numbers with the, with, um, the Hallmark Channel, People are really trying to connect with things like 
emotions, relationships, families, values. This is the underbelly of this Capricornian kind of surge that, that we're going through right now. And again, you know, I, I don't know when you want to talk about it, but you know, Bourdain for all let's, of his- let's just, let's just go there now. Let's just, we'll, we're just free flowing. We have things we want to hit on. We can get there in any order. So let's, okay. uh, let's start with Bourdain. So Bourdain is a cancer. He was born on uh, June 25th, 1956. So that makes him a monkey. And if you look at, I mean, if you kind of follow Bourdain's career arc, he's a bit of a trickster in a lot of ways. You know, he's able to kind of, you know, move between worlds. He's a very, you know, kind of Hermes-like character. He has Mercury and Gemini, which makes him, you know, bright and kind of raconteurish. And he has uh, Venus in Gemini, 20 degrees retrograde conjunct his sun. So there's a lot of Gemini in his chart. But he, Gemini is also his Achilles heel because he has the south node in Gemini. And to me, the south node is the Achilles heel of the chart. And that's the descending plane of the moon. So when he was born, the south node, the descending plane was in Gemini. And I rectified his chart because there's no birth time associated with it. And I have him as a Sag rising with his true node in Sag the ascending plane of the moon, first house, which means that he was vulnerable in relationship mm -hmm. because the south node and even Venus conjunct the sun retrograde in the seventh house makes him vulnerable to relationship. And clearly the last two relationships he's had made him extremely vulnerable on a number of different levels and probably relationships that he should not have been engaged in. In fact, relationship probably should have been something that would have been very different than the model that he subscribed to. Um, had he subscribed to the model of um, kind of, you know, it sounds you know, quite patriarchal, but kind of a, a range housewife, somebody who stays at home and is willing to be there and, you know, raise his daughter and wait for him when he comes back, that would have been one model that would have been probably more appropriate for him. Another model would have been uh, like somebody he could travel with and do the show with. And like somebody who was like working on the crew or, or the makeup right, artist. On the or crew or co-host, you know, somebody who yeah. shared that lifestyle. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is that he met um, both his wife and Asia Argento right around this area of Italy. Like his wife is from Sardinia. Right. And Asia Argento he met in Rome. And I believe that's where she was born and grew up. So it's like if you draw a line from Sardinia to Rome, they're like almost, you know, perpendicular. I mean, they're, they're parallel with one. Yeah. Right? So I, I did, I, so I rectified his chart and then I relocated it for Italy and he has Mars on his ascendant there. So he would be attracted to like powerful people, right? He'd be attracted to them because that's the nature of Mars. And even, to some degree, his, his kind of, you know, masculinity or virility would come out in those places. So he'd be attracted to other people. Now, his Mars is in Pisces, which is uh, not always quite direct. It's a bit, how should we say, creative in some ways, right? It's not like a macho Mars. Um, it, 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 well, and in some cases, it can actually be, Mars and Pisces can actually be addictive at the same time. I mean, so what was really interesting about this relocated chart though, is that when I looked at it, his son and his Venus were in the fourth house in Italy, in this one area. Had he actually lived in Italy, he could have had a very different kind of life. Mm. And, and, and a life that would have been much more family oriented because yeah. of the son and Venus in, in the fourth house. So he's a cancer. So we're dealing with this kind of, Again, this kind of Cancerian underbelly in Bourdain sort of, to some degree, fits that mold. Like, he's into food, uh -huh. right? very Cancerian yeah, thing. I, I, yeah, I totally, I, I, I mean, he, I, I, in a lot of ways, he had what would be a dream job for me. Just to, like, oh, be, totally. be, like be, you, to eat fancy shit. <laughs> An interesting like if you shit. go on my website, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, I, I say that I'm the Anthony Bourdain of astrology. Yeah. I'm going to have to change that now. Um, <laughs> but, um, so he represents in some ways kind of like this, this Cancerian vibe uh, where he can get into food. And the one thing about Bourdain that I, and again, this is astrological because his uh, son, his Venus were in trine with Neptune. 
So astrologically, that's like flow, right? It flows. It's like this emotion with Neptune and Venus. And his Neptune's in the 11th house, which means that that's friends and organizations. And Neptune, you could, you could hang out with anybody with Neptune in the, in the 11th house. So that, you know, I mean, it fits the, fits the bill, right? He's drinking beer with Obama in Vietnam and he's shooting guns in Texas with Ted Nugent. I mean, that actually really, so it's like, okay, that, that works. But there's a dark side, obviously, to Tony Bourdain. Mm -hmm. And Sarian Peace, because when he died, whatever happened there in that hotel room in Strasbourg, the, the sun was retrograding and he had a Saturn, I'm sorry, Saturn was retrograding and he had a Saturn Sun opposition going on. Is it? And it's, it's clearly this Saturn's in Capricorn, so it's clearly the Saturnian Cancerian opposition. Now, there are people who say that he was getting ready to turn, right? Like, I read a tweet tonight, whether it's real or not, that uh, it said, I have information that can lead to the imprisonment of Hillary Clinton. Have you seen that tweet? No. Okay, I just read it tonight. Whether that's his tweet or not, it's like, wow, that's pretty powerful. I'm not sure why he would say that, because anybody who would say that uh, would put themselves at great risk, especially somebody in the media, right? Yeah. Like, why wouldn't he just, like, bring the information forward? I don't, I don't know. I don't understand. Well, they, 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 all of these people seem to do this, right? They all, like, make announcements about the fact that they're going to make announcements that next week they'll be announcing that they're making an announcement. Right. Like, so you now they're you know, pushing up daisies, right? Yeah, you know what I mean? I, I do think it's interesting that as we're approaching eclipse season, again, we have celebrities hanging themselves, like we had last summer during eclipse season with Chris Cornell and Chester Bennington and amongst others, right? I know, right? Apparently, the, the sister of the queen of Holland hanged herself in Argentina. Did you see that? I, I saw something like that. I didn't. I, yeah, I, that I, happened like, what, a, a day or two ago? It was like, it was like Spade, Bourdain, and then sister of the Queen of Holland. Um, yeah. So this eclipse in Cancer is going to be very interesting because we're, we're dealing with some really intense energies now around this whole kind of pedophilia thing. Mm -hmm. it, it's like that just keeps bubbling up from the surface. And, you know, I don't know what to believe around this, uh, this thing that happened in Tucson. Did you hear about that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can, just, I can just, there? There, well, so like I, okay, so it's like, a, so I don't, I don't trust all of these patriot people, right? Like to me, like patriotism is not because I think that they're not nice people or something, but to me, patriotism is one of the biggest mind control programs going. So whenever I see any of these things being headed up by people who are pa veteran patriots or Christian patriots or whatever, I'm like, oh God, these, this is like, these are like the purple, perfect groups of people to infiltrate, to, to, to run sort of, even if the people themselves are good people, it's really easy to like trick them and run operations through them because they have, it's, they're easy to profile. You sort of know what they're going to do if you want. Why, why do they always seem like really fat and out of shape too? What's up with that? There's that, right? So, but so to me, I, I'm just suspicious of any of that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I used to live in Tucson and there is a lot of, um, some of the stuff, some of the strange, some of the strangest stuff that went on for me went on when I was living in Tucson. Um, and a lot of other people I know that are sort of like me have had interesting crossings through Tucson. So there is something going on there with, uh, trafficking, with mind control, with, uh, all sorts of operations involving, you know, infiltration and penetration of things and whatnot. So there's shit going on. Um, the one thing that I do think is interesting, and uh, like th this is actually, this is the only part that I've thought is really interesting so far, is I was looking at something that SGT Report was doing on this, and I've, pr I, you know, I followed him for a long time. He really lost me with his coverage of the QAnon stuff and whatever, because he just seems to have like lost certain touch with certain stuff, but I think he, he's done good work over the years. When he got into the QAnon thing and some of the things he's gotten into in the last year, something changed in his cadence and the way he delivers information that has me concerned about him. I, you know what I mean? And I find it difficult to listen to what he's doing, but he did have some reports on this. And my first thought was that, okay, he's, you know, he's again, kind of 
like fall, falling hook, line, and sinker for something. But he did bring up something that, that I, was really the only thing that's been interesting to me in this, and that he found this area of Tucson where this supposedly is going on, this community. And all of the schools and all of the organizations in Tucson on their logos had logos that looked like the boy lover shit from the Pizzagate stuff. Like the, 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 inter, the concentric the triangle, you know, the triangle inside, you yeah, know, the, right. all that yep. kind of shit. And yeah. like, to me, these symbols, uh, the symbols are really important. So, you know, I look for the single grain of something in the pile of bullshit. And to me, that was it. And it was interesting that it came from him. And so, you know, like, even though I, you know, am not on board with a lot of stuff he's talking about, I definitely thought he was, the, that was the most interesting thing that's come up in all of this is literally he had 10 or 12 different organizations in that area of Tucson that all had a symbol that looked like some of the stuff from pizza, you know, that was uncovered during the Pizzagate stuff. So yeah, I think there's something going on there. I mean, there's definitely a lot of immigrants there. So there can be, it's, you know, it's very easy for there to be uh, children who've been trafficked over the border hiding amongst, you yeah. know what I mean? There's all sorts of interesting, there's a lot of drug stuff going on there. There's, you know, cartel kind of stuff. Uh, it's also um, a university town. There's a lot of, um, interesting things that go on there medical trial wise there's a military base it's where the chemtrails come from the chemtrails kind of come from sort of right. between tucson and and phoenix it's where evergreen is it's near the marana air force base casa grande arizona there's tucson is a hotbed of all sorts of stuff um be it things that are occurring like semi-organically or things that are totally contrived there's definitely lots of shit going on there yeah i get a vibe that there's a big underground base in tucson there's a huge well I, i'll just say i'll just share it here so like when i haven't spoken about this publicly but at one point when i was living in tucson i it happened at least at least th three times i literally woke up in my car driving back from an area of town that i would never go to I would wake up in the same place every time. I would, I was in my car, I was driving. When I say wake up, I meant like come to, like come out of whatever malaise or trance or whatever I was in. And I right. was driving and it was an area of town, like on the lower west, lower west sort of part of town on the other side of the, of the, of the freeway, of the interstate freeway, an area of town that I never would go to. Three mm -hmm. times at least, I found, I woke up sort of driving back from there like late at night, like maybe, maybe not quite the middle of the night, but very late at night. And it was like a very industrial part of town. Um, and the tone of it to me, you know, in hindsight now, as I look back on it from the position of having healed a lot of this trauma for myself and come to terms with it is that, you know, yeah, there was something going on. And um, I picked up a lot of issues when I was there. I picked up a lot of, um, things that would uh, help to make one controllable. You know what I mean? Um, and I also, you know, I have a feeling like some of the stuff that I've talked about pertaining to underwater issues was going, was going on in Tucson because I also picked up a tattoo that doesn't really make any sense to me as a grown adult why I would have this tattoo. Oh, and it's of, a fish, it's of a fish blowing bubbles and it's on my foot. Um, and when the other thing that's interesting with the foot is when all of these... Uh, sexual abuse with the gymnastics stuff came up like i was reliving a lot of stuff physically and the tattoo was on the same area that had a lot of pain in my feet in the same area where that tattoo was and one of the things that came out in um some of the later like some of the stuff that's come out in, in like on the heels of this nasser stuff is that there's this one coach named john gettert who he his his, his is the gym that larry nasser would sometimes work out of when he wasn't at michigan state and that there was girls who reported being, so John Gettert's now been banned from USA Gymnastics too. Some girls reported being scared of him. And when they would try and run from him, he would step on their feet and hold them down, and not let them move. So like not, them, like not let them leave. And so I was having these pains in my feet months before this revelation came out. So I don't know if this is like some kind of tactic that is used when you're trying to do certain sorts of training or mind control or whatever. Um, but it's in the same area of my foot where the fish tattoo is also. Um, so I don't know what any of this means other than that it happened for me in Tucson. Um, and I've heard other people talk about their, you know, having some funny stuff going for them in Tucson. So that something, something, something's not kosher at the deli there. Well, I think Tucson is, is a vortex. Mm -hmm. I think there's something very big happening there energetically. My experiences with Tucson were, 
but I never lived there, but I did, I did spend a little time there traveling through Tucson. Mm -hmm. And there was one night, which was um, September 21st, uh, 1996. It was the, the night before my birthday. And it was a Saturday night, and they had this thing called Downtown Saturday Nights. And I know. I used to go there all the time. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, like right there, like on that, like where the train, where the sort of train yard came together with like a little right, square. Right. Where the Congress Hotel is yep. and stuff like that. I, I used to hang out in the Congress Hotel. I used to, yeah, uh, yeah totally. Yeah. So, um, that's when I was, I was, you know, traveling across the country doing tarot readings. And I wound up there on that night. Uh, and I just threw my table down and, Sort of doing tarot readings throughout the night. I gotta tell you, I mean, it was like the energy was off the off the charts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had I had a line. It was about twenty people deep. People were like weeping, sobbing, laughing. I'd never experienced anything like that before. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had to do with the fact that you know I had a sun sun conjunction going on my chart. But I'm telling you, the energy in that town was like yeah. kind of off the charts for that, and it was very interesting to me. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, I mean, I definitely, so I lived there for one year. I was coaching gymnastics at the time that I lived there. It was a very, I was in a difficult place in my life. At, at the time it was difficult. I hadn't yet figured out all the things going on with myself. So in hindsight, it makes a lot more sense why things were so difficult. So it was very tumultuous here, but I can't say that I disliked Tucson. Like there was some interesting, funky, weird kind of energy there to work with. And I did have some enjoyable nights out there and, and some fun times. But like, there was also just like the energy there is extremely intense. And I experienced certain kinds of physical body pains and issues there that I had never experienced anywhere else. And like, there was definitely, everything was like ramped up to here. I don't know that I could have stayed there more than the year I stayed there. I, you know, I wasn't there very long, but my experience was, was kind of like that, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah. So, Anyway, just, just circling it's back. Also, it's also a city where I would notice where there was very, um, I, like I had some of the experiences where I would find something I liked. I would like find a restaurant or like a little shop that I liked and I'd go back very quickly and it wouldn't be there and nobody would know what I was talking about. That's creepy. It's happened to me other places too, but it definitely happened there. And there was like, <laughs> That's yeah. yeah. I also had, That's I also so had, a very, I had another weird thing happen to me in Tucson. When This was long before I lived there. When I was doing college gymnastics, and I was on a gymnastics team at West Virginia University, we had a competition in, at University of Arizona. And it was the week of spring break. So we stayed, like being, it was still cold in West Virginia. So we came out early and enjoyed the, the weather. And my family came because they lived in Arizona. And we were, um, I can't remember if it was before the meet or after the meet, but I was away from the team and just with my family for a little bit. I was going out to eat with them at like fancy restaurant or whatever. So the team didn't do that kind of stuff, and that was kind of more my jam. And we're driving. I can't remember if we are driving to the restaurant or where we are going, but a car started driving straight at us. Like it was trying to chase us off the road, but not from behind us, coming straight at us. And, like, my, you know, my mom didn't know what to do, and she was freaking out and whatever. And like, it didn't make any sense. It was so strange. Now, if I, in some ways, if I'm um, – as I come to understand like what's been going on with me my whole life, in some ways, maybe it makes more sense. We had no idea what was going on. And we were meeting some family friends there. There were some like family friends that were in town too. And I just remember it was extremely scary. And then we ended up at this kind of restaurant that was in this courtyard of a shopping center that then ended up being very close to where I ultimately lived when I, uh, where I lived, you know, where I would have an apartment when I lived there. And in that courtyard, there was this shop that I would go to sometimes and everything I ever acquired from that shop was extremely symbol laden and had like a lot of Egyptian kind of looking stuff, a lot of pyramids, a lot of eyes. Like I was mesmerized by that stuff when I lived there and the first, but I didn't live there until probably seven years after I was there and ate dinner at this restaurant that first time and went in that shop the first time. So there was something about that place that was kind of calling me or having a lot of energy for me. So there's something, there's something there for sure. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, again, I wasn't there that long, but when I was there, I definitely tapped into it. Like that one night was like it was kind of off the charts and epic. I mean, people were just very open. Let's put it that way. The energy was like popping stuff. Yeah, popping. yeah. Especially um, in that downtown area down there. Yeah, I know the area in that area you're talking about. All sorts yeah. of interesting stuff. Um, just quickly circling back to the Bourdain thing. Yeah. Um, so 
one of the one of the thoughts that I had was this, this kind of sacrificial element to him, mm -hmm. whether or not somebody actually came in and offed him in his hotel, hotel room, mm -hmm. um, or he was driven to the point where he might do that to himself. Although I don't really buy the the bathrobe kind of you know uh, belt narrative. Um, it definitely feels like it's a sacrifice. He's, it's a very sacrificial kind of vibe. It feels very Wicker Man-esque. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this, we can get into this, this whole Me Too thing. Mm -hmm. When you look at, you know, Rose McGowan and, um, and Asia Argento, who's kind of like, you know, new, 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 to, the, new to the party. Well, and of course, also the, the person who started the Me Too thing was Alyssa Milano, who was on the show about witches, right? Wasn't she on a show about witches? Yeah, it's Charmed. It's Charmed. Yeah. And she, she's on the show with Rose McGowan, Shannon Doherty. Yep. Who's the other one? Uh, Sam, I knew you were talking is, about. It's she, she, um, was it like uh, Parker? It's three, it's three names. It's uh, Dunn. I, I, is Dunn or last I can see her. I can see her face, but I can't think of her name. But so it was really interesting. I, I looked. I looked at those four women today. I was looking at Charm today. Yeah. And um, Rose McGowan is the tallest one at five foot four. Mm -hmm. The other three are between five two and five three. Right. But those are really diminutive women. Mm hmm. And I just thought, wow, that's kind of amazing that they <laughs> found these four actresses and none of them are above five foot five. Right. You know, I don't know what, what, what that has to do with anything, but it was just like, it kind of blew me away because you know, we assume that you know, people are five, 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 six, five, seven. No, I mean, these, these women were like extremely small. They like were, my size. Yeah, like I'm your five, size. I'm five two. Five, I, you could have been uncharmed. Oh, well, I will say this, like, mo like a lot, the, most of the actor, like actresses and stuff in Hollywood, they're very, very tiny. They're very yeah. small. They're, they're my size. You know what I mean? Um, and, and smaller sometimes, very skinny. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, they, and they're all sort of have that, and I guess I sort of have it too, that sort of dark hair, dark complex, you know they're what I mean? Dark, dark kind of dark, look. Yeah. 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 So Melissa Milano, what's interesting about her, she used to date a lot of baseball players. She's dated, she has dated the most interesting collection of people. And the other thing that's, remember those, that weird videos she made, like where she was like, it was like a half sex video, half, half, we have to go to war in Syria video. Do you remember what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah. Yeah. Like she, I mean, what is like, she has like, first of all, why is anyone listening to Alyssa Milano about anything? Right. Exactly. We weren't listening to any of these people at anything. Right. I mean, but like, okay. yeah. The, the thing about Alyssa Milano, when she dated all those baseball players, like their careers was going to nosedives. Yeah. After they like they'd get hurt or they'd go into slumps. It was like, it was kind of mind blowing. Which baseball players did she date again? She dated Josh Beckett. That's one guy. That's that right. She dated. Yeah. Josh Beckett. She dated a whole host of like pitchers and then they, uh, which did she date one of the Weaver brothers, like Jared Weaver? Or one she of also guys? had did, she had a brand of baseball clothing for women, right? That's like, right. Yeah. Like if like if you wanted to go into a slump, you would date Alyssa Milano, right? And she also dated that singer from Ozo Motley, who then that group went no, like there was a huge they were a huge group, and then all of a sudden just nothing after she dated him. So she was she's kind of like in the Kardashian camp, and we know they're all witches, right? Or something. <laughs> Well, I think they're witches. I think, I think, I think they're, well, I think. I think witchcraft, witchcraft and vampirism are rampant in Los Angeles. They're, yeah. Like there are more active vampires here than anywhere else in the world, including like. Well, I can't do the whole Bourdain thing. Yeah. When, when I, when I looked at um, the, the chart of Asia Argento and Bourdain together, mm -hmm. Sinistry, uh, her Neptune is right on his Descendant and right on his true note, and he was lost, and he was lost in her. Like I would go so far as to say that she might have even cast a spell over him. Mm -hmm. That's that's my sense. Yeah. 
Well, and that, that they were probably teams. We're, we're having interference. That, as soon as you said she cast a spell on him, we had a bunch of weird interference. So anything you said uh, yes, in the last 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I also think that there was blood involved. That, you know, it kind of like Billy Bob Thornton, Angelina Jolie kind of blood stuff. Sure. But I think there was blood involved. I think they were doing some kind of sex blood magic rituals. That shit is yeah, that shit is huge. Billy Bob Thornton used to be on the same one of the same show, the same show my cousin was on, right? My yeah. cousin, she was on the same show with him. She was on a, a, a was, yeah, I try to forget what show she was on with him. But uh, you know, he like he was weird. He was super duper weird. That weird stuff, that blood shit, you know what I mean? Like this it's the same cousin that is now writing the uh, uh you know, the Santa Clarita diet, right? Um, oh wow. Yeah, my cousin. Yeah, I don't know if I've talked to. Yeah, so I, my my cousin my cousin writes that show, the Santa Clarita Diet. Um, so you know, like this stuff is like. I mean, at this point, they're like making fun of it, and you know what I mean. It's out there in the open and whatever. But this is this shit is big. It's serious in Hollywood. It yeah, really- I I think they, I think Bourdain and Argento were into blood sex magic. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that's what I think. In some degree of some degree of interpersonal vampirism. That's what it feels like. Yeah. And, you know, once you have somebody's blood or semen, you know, you've got the, you've got the code to their DNA, right? Yeah. You, have, you, can, like, you can basically run programs over them with that. That's how they do it. That's how they do it. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that's, how, that's how it's done, whether it be a, fish, a mind control thing or whether it be what you're talking about more with, I mean, all the mind control shit is based on Aleister Crowley and, you know, like uh, uh, L. Ron Hubbard kind of shit and, J- you know, Jack Parsons kind of shit and whatever. So, yeah. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. So, I think that was going on with Bourdain. And then, and, I, and then and he, he was an asset. And then he was an asset as well. Yeah, I think he was an asset. I mean, I feel, it feels like he was, he's got that kind of spy quality about him. Uh, especially with all the Gemini in his chart and, um, you know, his well, son. Spy quality or even what about Manchurian Candidate? Multiple personality I kind think, of quality, I, Well, I don't right? know. I mean, I think seriously, he could be seriously programmed you. based on his addiction. But I think, he, I think Bourdain was a spy as well. What was his addiction? You know, he had, he had, the, perfect, he had the perfect cover, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Absolute perfect cover could go anywhere in the like world. Like the Chuck Ferris guy. Yeah, you and I were talking about this yesterday. Yep. And I think I think Bourdain was kind of in that in that camp because that's the nature. I mean, even though he was a Cancer, he had you know, Mercury and Venus and Gemini, which is the bifurcation of, of identity itself. Right? So um, I think that was part of his program, really probably figuratively. Um, He's very, you know, and I think that this Wicker Man piece, because he was born just days after the summer solstice, which is when the Wicker Man rituals take place. Now, it could be coincidental, but it could also align him, you know, in a certain way, right, mm-hmm. for this kind of piece to take place. And it almost feels like he's like this, um, this sacrifice for the B2 movement, right? I mean, it kind of feels that way wow. in some ways, like that they, they burned him for for you know this for me too but also like if you're following what's going on with rose mcgowan like she's about to go to jail what you happened know, cocaine she got, she got busted Felony cocaine possession she got busted for cocaine right after she started speaking out about the uh, that, that's right that's right, right because um apparently weinstein uh, hired that um that black cube group to like track her down and you know Black Cube. You know that group. I've 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 been a little out of the loop, but I have heard people saying something about it. Can you tell me a little about it? Yeah, so Black Cube is a bunch of ex IDF people, Mossad people, of course. And uh, Weinstein hired them. They're like cleaners. They're like they're like Harvey Keitel and yeah, um, right, yeah. Wolf, right. And and so, but they're like much higher level. And they've got access to all kinds of technology. And, you know, they can tap phone, whatever they need, right? They can, they can so stop time and step outside of it and all that shit, right? Yeah. So he apparently, yeah, he apparently hired them 
to do damage control on Rose McGowan. Mm -hmm. And that's when the cocaine, like it's a felony, right? It's not, it wasn't just like some misdemeanor of having like a quarter gram or something. You know, felony cocaine possession, that's a schedule one drug. And you can, you know, if she gets into the wrong court or she gets into a court that's loaded, she can, she can be put away. Right. She could go to, she could go to jail anywhere between, you know, two, two to five years and she's on ice and nobody talks to her. Yeah. So that, you know, that's taking place. And I also feel like in some ways, like, because there's this whole sacrificial element to, like... Wouldn't it be weird if she, like, got arrested? I just, this thought just popped into my mind. Wouldn't it be weird if she got arrested in real life, but then showed up as the guest star on the next season of Orange is the New Black? <laughs> like, that would be the perfect, like, weird blending of, of reality and fiction that's going on now. Like, see what I'm saying? You, you, know, the, you know, where we are, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. And, I just, and like, I just she wasn't really in jail. She was just on Orange is the New Black. And like, we, are, like, like right now there's such a blend like between virtual reality and reality. We're all talking about, do we live in a simulation? Like whatever, like what if like literally like she got arrested and then the jail she was in is Orange and then it, I, like, if, if it happens, I said it here first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredibly surreal, but we're living in, you know, surreal times in yeah. a lot of ways. Where everything's yeah. upside down, reversed, um, and, and it's actually quite hard for people. I believe a lot of mm -hmm. people are having a very difficult time. Yes, trying to you know untangle the world that we're living in, and where it's headed, or where it's not headed in a lot of ways, too. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think there's this kind of sacrificial quality to Bourdain's death. Yeah, and he feels very you know wicker man esque. Because mm -hmm. he's like, a, you know, I would, call, I would call Bourdain like a top beta, right? He's not an alpha. Mm -hmm. He'd like to be an alpha, but he's like a top beta. Yeah. And, um, and in a lot of ways, like if you, again, if you look at his marriage with Octavia's first wife, and then the, the, uh, even the, the, the affair with Argento, there's like this quality of, like when I watched him, on those first episodes where he meets her in Sardinia. She's like putting him down. You know, she's already establishing dominance. So, uh, he seems to me like the kind of person who might like that. Like he might like being a submissive. Like he, likes, he might like that kind of sex play and stuff like that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think, I think that that's the case. Um, anyway, it, it's, it's a lot of stuff is still, you know, emerging from like his, tw his Twitter feed, his Instagram, Argento's Instagram. And a lot of stuff is incredibly dark. Just really, really, like I, I, I ran across a picture of a birthday cake for his daughter, her 10th ten, her birthday, 10th year, right? Yeah. And it's like a birthday cake that has like fingers coming out of it. And the, and the cake looks like a crypt kind of. Yeah. And, and the fingers almost zombie like, like that's her birthday cake for her 10th birthday. That's you know? weird. It is weird. And then on the Argento side, there's all kinds of like, you know, triggering stuff. Like there's this one picture of her daughter when her daughter is 10 years old, and both her and her daughter are wearing red shoes, which is a program. Right. right? Totally. Yep. I, I know all about it. <laughs> yeah. So you can see a lot of this stuff on their Twitter feeds and their Instagram. And, um, like there's this one Instagram picture where I think Bourdain is like, it's either his hand or somebody else's hand and they're, they're holding a human heart that's like covered in blood. Mm -hmm. The hands, I mean, just really, really dark stuff. You can see it on both of their Instagram uh, feeds and Twitter feeds. So there's, there's a whole dark underbelly to, what's, you know, what took place. And what's also really fascinating now is here comes the Capricornian piece over the top, which is this whole suicide prevention thing. Okay. Right? So this is, okay. I was just going to say something and that's funny. I have something that I want to say about that, but I'm going to wait until we're in the patrons. I were to say it. You can go where what you're going to say. You're going to, um, yeah, I just I think I, there's something I want to say that I need to say only in the patrons hour, not to be suspenseful or keep people, whatever, but just from my own, my own issue here, but um, yes, yeah, so, the suicide prevention so, thing is very interesting. Go ahead, please. Well, with every 
story on Bourdain, there's a sidebar or a, um, a little chunk that's carved out inside the story about suicide prevention. Yep. And here's the number, right? Yep. Here's the number you can yep. call. And one of the things that um, I can't believe you brought this up. This is so I, I, you'll you'll die when you hear what I'm going to say. Okay, go on. Okay, so Rose McGowan did this open letter, and she was talking about Bourdain and, and Argento, and how they had a very different kind of relationship. It was one that didn't have any borders, meaning they weren't monogamous, and um, and that he had said that. He'd never met anybody else that wanted to die more than he did, meaning Asia Argento. Right. And then she says, well, she got help and he didn't. Well, you know, when I read that, it's like, again, it was almost like. That's coded. That's coded language. It's almost like the transference yep. of her suffering and her pain went on to him. Mm -hmm. And now he's gone. Right. So it's almost like this animistic yeah. transmission. Yep. Right. So there was that. And then she, she talks about, this is the weird part. Like, well, you know, respect their privacy. Yep. Respect their privacy and know that basically they're dealing with this, you know, deep, dark, you know, kind of force that, you know, is you can't articulate it and it's hard to fathom and understand but it threatens all of us and can swallow us all mm -hmm. like what is that i'm not paraphrasing a little bit here but she's basically saying that, that there's, there's an entity out there that is waiting to eat all of us absolutely yeah. absolutely that's exactly what she's saying yep and um, I mean, it was it was just a bizarre open letter. So I've heard that um, there's a call to up the the amount of lithium in public water. Have you heard this? No, no. But I mean, I know they're spraying it in the fucking chemtrails. I know it's in the water at this point. But I, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't. I mean. Everybody, we have a lot of zombies already. They want, you know, I mean, I think that if you can get people zombied enough, it allows the entities to come into the body. So like, you know, I, I would be very interested to understand. I mean, you know, with some of my work with like the sugar and the different kind of stuff and just the different minerals and elements in the, in the body. Like, I'm curious as to like, what kind of entity would be attracted to that element? Like what having lithium in the body will make it a portal for what entity, for what energy? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, anybody who drinks water, the city water here is insane. Yeah. Well, the water here isn't too bad, and they're not, they're not putting fluoride in it yet. There's naturally occurring fluoride. That's, that's um, a little different. But I, but I still, I, you know, I still kind of stay away from it, <laughs> you know, nonetheless. But you're so, yeah, you're, you're in flyover cool. country, though, so the water there probably isn't quite as loaded as the water. Uh, no, I mean, there's a lot of spring water here. There's a lot of aquifers here, so... It's probably, you know, on a scale of 10, 10 being great and one being Los Angeles, it's probably about a seven. But that's, I heard you talking about that on one of your shows about the fluoride, that there was no fluoride in the water there. That's, There's no, yeah, the machine broke. So we're trying to rally the people here locally to keep them from turning the machine on and adding two parts per million so we get more fluoride, which is ridiculous. Are, are you serious? The machine broke or is that just like? No, it's true. The machine broke and they went out and bought a new one, but they haven't hooked it up yet. So we're doing our best to convince um, the city water management to just keep it in mothballs. For a it while. is so weird how under the fluoride mind control people are. Like I'm doing holistic, you know, nutrition school right now, and there are some people in the like class that seem to be under the impression. That, like there was somebody talking about adding good fluoride back into their water. I'm like, good I, fluoride. Adding, but like, I, I just, you know what I mean? Like someone who does reverse osmosis and then adds good fluoride back in. I'm like, I, I, I don't, I mean, I understand that there's like some naturally occurring fluoride, but like people really think that fluoride is something that we're supposed to have in our body and it's just not. 
I mean, there's some naturally. Yeah, I, you, know, you, know what I, you know what I think? It's, it's almost like, um, you know, it's almost like this extension of order, order takers and order followers. Yeah. And they, they get off on, yeah. you know, vaccines or adding. It's like it makes them feel good. Yep. You know, they, they get this sense that, you know, they're doing something, you know, kind of really, I don't know, wholesome. For it's themselves so and for other, it's it's like this really weird twisted even, even, logic. Even in a holistic nutrition pro, and this isn't everybody, but there's some like well, they're supposed to be. I mean, I understand that they're not as far fringe people. They're going to be as far fringe as you and I are. But like you'd think that if you found yourself in a holistic nutrition program, you you would have deprogrammed the fluoride uh, program by the, you know. And it's right. just, it's weird to me. Like there's a few that are really um, deep seated programs that like. No matter how far off the reservation you've gone in some other areas, this one is like a, a leash. Yeah, I mean, you know, the image that I have when I think of this now is I, I actually have this image of like these, you know, like small creatures. Mm -hmm. You know, these small little kind of creatures that get into like your brain or, you know, just above your brain at the fourth dimensional level. Yep. And when you do something, it, it, it almost like satiates them in some ways, right? Yep. They, they get off on it. And it and the, but the transmission is you do this yeah. and you'll feel better about yourself. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. These creatures, like, so I'll be talking about this with a, guest, with a co host coming up in a few weeks. And we've talked about it before on the show. This is almost sort of like an octopi energy kind of entity, like an octopus. Except, yeah. So, yeah. We're going to go. Feel, it feels like that. I mean, yeah. Carlos Castaneda talks about like inorganic beings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, he actually, even though he made like 90% of that stuff up, mm -hmm. a lot of it is actually like really interesting. Totally. And he says that essentially when we're born, mm -hmm. we have one of these beings that's attached to us mm -hmm. and that follows us throughout our lives. Oh, when if we don't have it already attached to us, isn't that maybe what the Nogalase enzyme is that you and I have talked about before that they inoculate you with the first thing when you're a baby? Yes. Yep. So if it's not already attached to us, then they're making sure it's going in. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It, yeah. yeah. That's, it's, it, it's interesting. It's very, it's, you know, so, yeah, we're doing our best right now to keep the fluoride out of the water. Yeah. And um, it's really fascinating, too, just like the cursory responses that we, we got number one in the meeting and number two um, in the local paper. So there's this woman that I've, I've met here. She's older, her name is, uh, I'll, I'll leave her name out. She's older. And she kind of like, you know, rallied a few people. And apparently she, somebody goes to, you know, city council meetings and speaks up about things, right? Yeah. They knew who she was. And I brought in some people that I knew, kind of a, a high powered dentist from Austin, who's been fighting the anti-fluoride fight for a long time, a chemical engineer, PhD. So, you know, we came prepared. And, you know, the mayor said, oh, um, that's really interesting. I guess you got all these people together, meaning this woman, right? Like, they, like she was already kind of, like, profiled. Right. Right? And she, and she was like, no. You know, these, some of these people came of their own accord. So that was one thing that was interesting. And the other thing was – the reporting that took place in the local paper here. And the reporter basically said that um, most of the people were opposed to fluoride. There was not one person who went up and spoke that was in favor of fluoride. So right. why would that reporter like not actually report what happened? Right. At, and this is just at a very low level, right? This is just a city reporter probably makes around 35, maybe 40 grand a year at the most. Right. And she had to insert that, mo no, it wasn't most. Everybody was against the fluoride. And I thought that that was really fascinating. And so just at a low level, right, mm -hmm. at a low level, you had the mayor, you know, practicing a form of typology yep. with the person and in a way that was kind of dismissive. And then you have this reporter who has to put in the fact that, well, most of the people, well, it was all the people 
And it's like, that's it. It's yeah. right there on the front lines. I mean, that's yeah. what we're up against. Yep. And, and yeah, it, 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 and it's just her own general societal sort of mind control programming. I mean, may, I, maybe they have that's people- That's really low level stuff. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, you, you, it's hard to think that they have that shit infiltrated. Maybe they fucking do. But um, I think this has been interesting for you, going back to li- living, living in a small town where you can actually, you know, be seen at some of these things. And, you know, I actually think this will be interesting for you. I can't wait till you get to the point where you're basically reading the, the, the city councilman's chart to him. You're basically saying, well, you have this and this, and that's why you're doing this. And <laughs> right. I want you to, like, I can just see you showing up with like, I ran your chart last night and I didn't have a birth time. So I rectified it. And this is what I see. <laughs> well, I know, the, I know the chart, of the, <laughs> I know the chart of the city. <laughs> that, that could be interesting. That could be an interesting. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. And, so, you know, where are we, where are we going now? I mean, post Bourdain, post Spade, um, you know, post this guy. I mean, and, and, and what did we have the week before? We had, we had Roseanne, we had Tommy Robinson. I mean, it's all in the span of like, what, two and a half weeks? Yeah, like, that, and that's all old news. news. That, that's all old news. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and the Tommy Robinson thing was just retarded. And the people are still going on and on about that in some ways. The Roseanne thing is more just sad to me than anything because... She's totally sad. I came yeah. to the conclusion yeah. that that's a woman that needs help. She's a, she's, she's a woman who, you know, she's a, she's a woman. She's a human being. She has faults and foibles, but she's also at times tried to take stands for things that mean something to her. She's mentally ill. She, she's not a racist. She, she's, you know what I mean? Like she's just a, a flawed human being who has been used. I think the setup was the whole time to like have this thing go on with the show, have her be a Trump supporter and then bring it down and see well, if all the Trump supporters are racist. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Even, even the fake ones on TV. Yeah. 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 I so. totally, I totally agree. All right, so we're getting to the end of the first hour here. We're going to take a quick break. Join us over in the patrons hour. Before we get over there, Robert, tell people where, where they can find you. Well, you can find me at robertphoenix.com. And I have a uh, YouTube channel, um, 11th House Radio. Actually, it's 11, the 11th House and Radio Farcast. They're kind of under one umbrella. And I hang out a lot on Facebook. So yep. those are the places you can find me. All right, so... Um, I want to say a special thank you to the patrons who make the first hour possible for everyone else and join us over on the second hour with them for that. We're going to get into uh, MKUltra and athletes and uh, the serious problem with the intellectual dark web. We'll see you on the other side. See you in a minute. Don't know, 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 don't know